Yes, Amborish, uh, we might as well start. Huh? It's just 5.30. Two more minutes to go, sorry. We have 100. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, more than 100. Well passed. Ombud is there, it's 5.30. Okay, should we start? Please, I'm ready. Yeah, please go ahead. Good evening. As I get on to welcome and introduce Dr. Obhijit Binag Bandapadhyay, I wonder really how to welcome one whose mere presence amidst us brings more grace to us than anything at all to him. And as regards his introduction, there are, I believe, hardly any extra beat that I can add to the knowledge of any Calcutan about him and his accomplishments and his anecdotes. No one here has missed even a single piece of information about him in their own research work about him. His academics from presidency, JNU, to Harvard, to Princeton, to MIT, his approximately more than 40 professional honors, achievements, fellowship, Gerald Loeb Award, Guggenheim Fellow, Alfred Sloan Fellow, Ford Foundation Professor at MIT, eight books, three films, all are known by heart to every erudite, well-informed intellectual Kolkata. So the introduction in that case may need not therefore just be mere restating of those known facts. But I was just thinking whether that can be on how he himself would like to be known for posterity, apart from his achievements and accolades. Would he, <clears throat> would he want to be identified more as a pragmatic rebel amongst the classical economists? He brought economics from its macros, its hugeness, its abstractness, lofty ideas to a field level, evidence-based explanation, changing the entire paradigm of the developmental economics. He questioned the prevalent practice of generalization and predicting of the human behavior by economic theories, philosophies, ideologies, but contrarily engaged himself in inferring behaviors through interventions by applying assiduous testing on human behavior and predicting outcomes. Interesting, of course, as I was going through a couple of his speeches and particularly the one after his Nobel laureate uh, receiving acceptance speech, is interesting is his acknowledgement of a concept gossip in spreading certain policies and test the corresponding outreach and its effectivity. The concept of the RCT, with whom he has now become synonymous actually, the random control trial, seated in medical science was advanced and perfected by him in poverty alleviation, health, education, and climate. His own pioneering institute, JPAL, Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, 
formed along with his wife, Mrs. Esther Daflo and Mr. Sandal Mulainathan, worked amongst the marginalized cases in the third world countries on impact evaluation, policy outreach, and capacity building. He got his Nobel for his exper experimental approach in alleviating global poverty, but possibly much, much before that. And even now he got his, he's getting his recognition more than Nobel in the heart of the large section of poor and deprived from around various parts of the world because of the benefits they're getting because of his approach to the implementation. Bengal, of course, our own state is no exception, whereas JPAL did significant work in agri-intervention, which I know. Dr. Banerjee also has interesting shades in his personality. As I understand, he's a great cook whose family members feel had there been a novel on that, he would have by now got his second one. A fun-loving, witty, interest in various things of life, including sports. But his friends say, I don't know, he never himself did very well in that. Me being an ardent East Bengal supporter, as far as sports interests goes, I always wondered why is he a lifetime member of the Monbaran Club? but of course willing to condone one or two such small blemishes in his otherwise highly illustrious career. Interestingly, a liberal Democrat as he is, as we all know, he went to Tihar jail for 10 days while in JNU for his position on some JNU policy matter, which faced him sedition charges, possibly the first and the last former inmate of Tihar getting Nobel. He has his views, liked or disliked, he does not care but always candidly expressed on government's pandemic management, migration labor policy, poverty alleviation policies, and even he went up to the point of talking about them on their stand on Kashmir while maintaining a different view on Palestine's own identity. But he, didn't, he, he doesn't care about whether he's going in favor or against the establishment. We are now keen to hear him engage in conversation with our president, Mr. S. N. Mukherjee Gopal, who also is a luminary in law, a highly respected and nationally acclaimed Supreme Court practitioner, a student of Cambridge and Rudra Chatterjee, a student of Columbia, who worked with Booz Allen and Hamilton and now managing a huge conglomerate spanning across various countries. At the end, I would also like to add, Obhijit Babu has also done me and some of my co-management committee members a favor by studying in South Point. Until as a student of South Point, he got his Nobel in 2019, we were made to believe by my management committee colleagues, most of whom come from St. Xavier's, that the world's best talents all flow only from there. We non Xavierians got some voice after your Nobel announcement over here. May we now welcome Nobel laureate Dr. Banerjee, who brought in a paradigm shift in the development policy evaluations, President Mr. Mukherjee and Mr. Rudra Chatterjee to commence the conversation, please. Over to President Mr. Mukherjee. Thank you, Ambarish, for that uh, uh, introduction and being kind to both Rudra and me. Um, and me. Now, and it gives me tremendous pleasure to have a friend of four decades on the same panel as me to discuss matters which are worrying the world today. I value his opinion and I hope to make today's engagement interesting from our end and I'm sure he'll do from his. Now, before I take it any further, there are a few house rules. I request all members of the audience who have logged in today to be in mute mode. Uh, we would not like any disturbance while the panel discussion is on. Second, the discussion is going to be freewheeling. It is going to be on topics of uh, current interest. And we will proceed on a question answer basis. And hopefully this discussion between the three of us will continue for about 40, 45 minutes. After which we are going to have questions from the audience. Now my request is that the questions are put on the chat box and Mr. Rudra Chatterjee will then put select only five, not more than five questions to put to our speaker today 
Dr. Obhijit Binayak Banerjee. He is pressed for time. I'm grateful to him to making time for us. Thank you very much, Obhijit. Now, may I put the first question to you? Please, please, please go ahead. So, Obhijit, about 10 years ago, you presented your book, Poor Economics, to me. Now, in the forward to your book, Esther and you wrote, and I'll just quote from here, that the book makes clear why hope is vital and knowledge critical, why we have to keep on trying even when the challenge looks overwhelming. Success isn't always as far away as it looks. Now today, in the midst of this pandemic, when India's economy has been devastated, large number of people have fallen before the poverty line. How do we keep our hopes alive? Where do we look for hope? And how do we overcome the damage caused by it? Floor is yours, Obhijit. So I, I, I guess I, I think that um, I can't, I don't want to give a recipe for uh, for what the what the next uh, you know the next step should be but I think the general point is that till 2019 if you take the 20 years before 2019 the most striking fact about the, the this period is that this overall world poverty declined massively and it's not just in India and China it's also true in countries like Bangladesh Vietnam, Pakistan, uh, Nepal, a bunch of countries, you see uh, a substantial amount of decline in poverty. This is um, the second thing, maybe even more important, quality of life measured by things like um, infant mortality. Uh, infant mortality from, is halved in this period globally. Uh, the maternal mortality is reduced by, I think, a third. It's 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 extraordinarily. Uh, if you take the, I mean, at the beginning of think about the beginning of this period. Beginning of the period, people are dying right and left from HIV. Essentially, deaths of HIV. We've forgotten how how much of a scourge it was. It was just it was two thousand year two thousand. We were still. In in the poor countries, there was still no um, cure for for uh, HIV. The cure was too expensive. All of these, this was there's a number of major breakthroughs. For example, the distribution of uh, insecticide insecticide treated bed nets. The fact that HIV medicine is now available essentially free everywhere in the world. Um, huge increases in vaccination of children and all of this has saved a lot of lives so i i think that if you i think we should not lose the perspective of the last uh, 20 years this has been a, a disaster perhaps a disaster that will have long term consequences but i w i wouldn't take away the the just the sheer magnitude of progress that leads up to 2019 Ujita, I'll ask a follow-up. In fact, you know, even before that period, uh, from the Second World War onwards, you know, great things happened. You know, in terms of mortality reducing, invention of the penicillin, infant mortality kept reducing every decade. Uh, currency systems were formed. Countries reduced, you know, trade barriers. There's a feeling that over the last five, 10 years, despite the fact that things have improved uh, you know, by some parameters, we've run out of steam. And we've run out of steam in the institutions itself, the institutions that were created in the 1940s, whether it is the you know, Bretton Woods or United Nations or you know, things that you know, after our independence, the, the growth, whether it's, and it is replaced by protectionism, in some way, tribalism uh, and COVID has exacerbated. 
I'm not, I don't know, you know, can you tell me what the new institutions would be? But more question is, how should we think of new institutions and where should we look for that? Hey, you know, I, I, again, I, I want to, I, I, you know, sound uh, at least resist uh, the, the, that sense of encircling doom. I, I think that fine, yes, uh, there is, but if you think of the world, you know, the even India, which has, I think, been guilty of, of uh, you know, encroaching protectionism, etc. We're not in 1990 or in 1985. This is just a different world. It's it's still true that the tariffs are nowhere near what they used to be, or the the quantitative uh, constraints on on imports, the number of licenses you have to get, all of that is still not there. And I, and I think that, I mean, I, I think that we have a problem, we have a problem, I think you you identified it right, that the tribalism is driving a certain amount of, uh, you know, let's find someone to blame for our pain. Uh, and I think each country is doing that in their own way by blaming minorities, bl blaming, uh, China blaming, uh, and of course, in many cases, as with China, there is probably some element of truth in it that uh, I won't say in many cases, but in some cases, the element of truth in China, China does uh, look, you know, a bit too much of a, you know, it, it, it played a very complicated game to get where it got, the currency was devalued for forever and ever and made made the Chinese economy competitive with, I think the estimate is it spent $3 trillion kind of subsidizing production basically. So I, I, and I think that, that that did undermine faith in WTO and rightly, I think in some senses, uh, we, we realized that some country that really wants to you know play play this game ruthlessly, it's very hard to stop it. We don't have the, we do, I don't think an institution, I won't blame the institutions. I think the institutions were doing their job. It just, if you want to, you can afford to spend $3 trillion to uh, subsidize the currency and therefore keep basically Chinese prices low, then that's going to be always a little bit of a, uh, something that's very hard to regulate. Basically, I don't know how, how the WTO would have stopped that. And I think, the, and I think the probably the right mechanism is the one we have now, which is that people are protesting. The Chinese are both, you know, claiming they have done nothing wrong and slightly trying to be defensive about it. And that's probably the is a political. It has to be a political negotiation where you know some price is paid by uh, China for that, and um, whether that's. Uh, whether it will be, I, unfortunately, we've done it in inefficient ways. There will be like the U.S. tariffs on on steel and aluminium and things like that, which are completely useless and uh, don't protect any, anybody uh, really, but do a lot of damage to world trade and especially symbolically. So I, 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 do, I do think that in the end, what we need is not more, I think, trying to think of institutions that are going to solve a really enterprising, somewhat ruthless program of uh, nationalism is probably, you know, I, I, I don't think that's realistic. What's realistic is what's happening now, which is a certain amount of political pressure, um, whether that works or not. Uh, but I think that that has to be the shape of the future. It has to be political rather than institutional. Yes, so I uh, will do a question probably unconnected with what has been uh, uh, the query put forward by Rudro. Uh, I find that one area where there hasn't been much discussion, but which is quite clearly a fallout of the pandemic, is that it has created complete havoc in the lives of the young. There is a possibility of a high dropout rate from school. Uh, there's possibility of severe 
uh, mental stress amongst the youth. Uh, now, will these factors, and this is also because, you know, there's been inequality in access to education and the education that's been provided has been on the digital platform. It's not like uh, physical education with physical presence. It's very, very different. And will these factors, do you feel that will these factors have economic ramification and perpetuate inequalities in future? And if so, what policy measures would you suggest should be adopted to redress this both in the short and long term? So look, uh, you know, I, I think that <clears throat> in very much, I think the answer to your two questions are very closely tied to each other, which is that I think that the, what, what, the solution to the problem is not that hard, but if we don't do it, we will pay for it. And the solution is uh, to recognize that something institutionally we are very bad at recognizing, which is that for kids who come from, you know, backgrounds of most people who are on to, on, on this uh, this Zoom, uh, this the school curriculum is sort of preparing them for be globally competitive or whatever those you know those easy words that get bandied around for most other people the curriculum is meaningless it's meaningless because they are usually behind grade level we know that roughly 50% of all children in class 5 cannot do second class 2 level math so they're always behind. So then there is this fantasy of a curriculum, which you know is so global and so modern and so uh, wonderful, but it is irrelevant for most people because we don't, we actually don't help them catch up. So what that says, and that was true before the pandemic. So what is that says is that in a sense we are, the problem is less. Uh, about the pandemic itself, which has been a disaster. I agree with you, that's entirely a disaster. Then with our attitude, if we actually came in with the attitude that, look, our priority right now is to get children to catch up. Let's focus on what they don't know. And we'll discover that it's not just this last year they lost. They lost three years before that. Let's focus on the catch up. If we focus on the catch up, we'll do everybody a favor. You know, maybe not the the few few lucky ones who happen to be at the top of the class, but everybody else will do a favor. And so, if we just focused on that, I still feel that since people roughly learn two months in a year, if you calibrate the learning kind of crudely, you say that you know every two two months, uh, every year they learn about two months of worth of material, three months worth of material. So we have three months, let's take three months and let help them catch up one year and take another three months and help, help them catch up another year. So I think if we actually took the idea that the real problem is uh, a, a, a kind of lagging children who are way behind the year, then the fact that they were now going to be one more year behind is irrelevant. The problem is going to be that we're going to say, oh, they're in class eight. They must be studying chemistry. Even though they can't read, we'll get them to study chemistry. And of course, that's going to be a disaster. And I think our mindset till we recognize that it's not what we uh, insist uh, on as the curriculum, but what is relevant to the children that needs to be taught, uh, we will always fall behind. So I think in that sense, I feel both there is an opportunity here. We could do better. We could just be for a minute relaxed, a, year, a couple of years relaxed. Let's forget about the curriculum or we could screw up. I, I, I'm not taking any bets on this one. I've seen people screw up too often, but it's not that hard to fix it. So touching on your answer and also your answer to the previous question, touching on your answer, you know, are we going to just go back to, you know, we lost two years of growth. We'll go back to, I'm sure that most of the world will grow rapidly this year and next year. In some ways, it is probably like the 1920s after the first world war, the war finished rapid growth again, but no change in institutions. You know, can't we do something to fix this education changes, you know, like or climate change and other things? What like what I've been reading, you're talking about like printing money, 
but that was tried in US, that's QE, right? Printing money. And you know, that essentially exacerbated, you know, it, it was great for the stock market, great for you know, cost of capital, but can't we do something more institutionally fixing the problems of climate, of education while coming out of this pandemic? Look, I think there's a short run and a long run. The printing money is not about the long run. It's about restoring demand in the economy. I think the economy is, has been demand short since 2016, at least, and perhaps before that. I think, and that was a result of number of things, but I think partly, uh, you know, the, if you, in real terms, uh, the procurement prices were peaked around 2009-2010, and since then pre procurement prices for agriculture, which is sort of income to the poor, a lot of, has fallen. Okay, so we we're, we're really been tightening the reins throughout, and the demand shortage is not an accident. Demand shortage is a decision by by the government. I would say, so point number one in the short run, I think we could do more about the demand shortage. I, I think that's a, uh, so I, now fixing the institutions is on a different time scale. We're not going to fix uh, our institutions. Think of the one that Gopal knows a lot about, uh, the judiciary. It's a disaster. It's a, like, you know, you pick up uh, states where there is a huge backlog of, of cases and you can see that in those places, businesses are much worse at getting in their inputs. There's all kinds of uh, very simple problems. We, could we fix a judiciary? Yes, we have, we've never appointed enough judges. We, oh, could we, in, in some ways it's, but it, could we do it in a day? No, it will require a certain amount of vetting, a certain amount of legitimation. Even if these judges are going to be just as good as anybody else, we need certain amount of legitimation. The legitimation process seems to be broken. Maybe I'm going to throw that question back to you, uh, to Kopal, to say, how would we fix the judiciary? It's a, it's a very, very practical question. We could, I want to throw it back to him. I mean, I would lo love to see that fixed. And it seems straightforward as a, as a, at the, you know, at the bird's eye level where I am looking at it, it looks, why can't we do this? This one has been identified as a problem for 25 years at least. Why are we doing it? I'll, I'll, I'll come straight back uh, with the answer. Uh, I, th I think there's uh, uh, no political will to uh, sort this out. There is no basis for... Uh, uh, there's not a uniform basis for selection on uh, merit. Uh, uh, third, uh, there are too many hidden agendas which are working and really people don't seem to be bothered about it. People who are running the country. The Supreme Court has vacancies. The Supreme Court today has vacancies, which is unheard of. The last Chief Justice's tenure, we didn't have a single appointment to the Supreme Court. So it's the collegium which is holding things up. It's probably... Um, or, or it's the government which is holding, holding things up. We don't have a, a proper procedure in place. Uh, there are always uh, uh, doubts cast about whether the procedure was at all fixed, whether second, whether it, wa it was at all um, uh, followed. Uh, it's just uh, uh, something which is not transparent at all. And that's the one thing which needs to be transparent, the appointment of not just the higher judiciary, the lower judiciary as well. If we look at, if we look at the uh, case backlogs, we should be looking at the lower judiciary first. And I think here, what's really important is the criminal justice system has actually failed. It has failed completely. And that affects the poor more than anybody else. And during the course of this pandemic, another sad thing which has happened is, yes, high courts, and the higher judiciary have got used to uh, of video conferencing. They've had the infrastructure laid out, but where it's needed most, it's not reached. The district courts actually where they ought to have video conferencing. Nobody is suggesting for a moment that everybody gets tech savvy and can actually start reading uh, off the tablet or the computer. They still read from their papers, fine, but at least provide access by letting the litigant know that he is being seen, he is being heard, and his matters are not getting shelved simply because of the pandemic. We've had enough time to work this out, and this has not happened. 
There's a little monopoly going on in the high judiciary on this. And even in the high judiciary, frankly, I have found that at times, even when the court has time to take up matters, it will not because its perception is that some matters are not urgent enough. But there is time within court hours. Now, all this really has to change. People have to work overtime. People have to strive to improve and have to adapt with the times to make justice delivery system work. I, I, I firmly believe that it's all sections of the bar. It is the judiciary, as well as the, uh, the, the, the people in power, the government, the executive, the legislature, who are all to blame in this. It can be fixed, as you quite rightly say, on, a, on the basis of a bird's eye view. So I, I think I'll leave it at that. In fact, one of our friends, Joydeep, should be there, who's uh, at this <laughs> uh, webinar, and, uh, and uh, he would probably have a lot of answers to uh, the, the questions, but we look forward to you actually being in India when we can sit down and have a chat on that. Yeah, I, 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 I hope to learn from you. I, I, I find this baffling, to be honest. It's one of the places where there seems to be no progress uh, except in very, you know, like through on, on debt recovery or something, a few specific interventions was almost nothing else changes over uh, 25 years. It's, it's one of the least uh, progressive areas, let's say. Absolutely. Now, can I get back to you with a question? Uh, please. Yeah. So uh, you have written about uh, vaccine access being, and I'll quote here, deeply unequal. I think that was an, uh, what you wrote in The Guardian in the global scenario. And uh, you have made an argument there, uh, both moral and economic, uh, for uh, rich countries to share their existing vaccine stocks. Now, I, uh, with the poorer nations, and uh, I was just thinking, I mean, most of these rich countries are democracies. Is it uh, politically practical to get uh, the leaders of these countries to really uh, share the existing stock of vaccines? Or there could be other ways uh, in which to make uh, uh, vaccines, uh, distribution of vac vaccines and administration of vaccines more equal. And I use that in quote unquote, more equal. So I, I think you're right that I think it's going to be, I mean, they have now, they're dragging their feet. Uh, this commitment of, I mean, the uh, 1 billion doses is not going to get us where we need to get to, which is to, you know, I am guessing 8 billion doses for the 4 billion people who, who need them. So I, I think it's, they're dragging their feet. And that's partly because the political commitments are, uh, difficult. I, on the other hand, I, I mean, it's also the case that it's a, it is a democratic failure, and I don't understand what is it. I mean, the UK should be is right now. It's it's shutting down its own um, sort of planned opening because of the so-called Delta, uh, the Delta variant, and. And this will keep coming. I mean, if they if they, if they actually don't solve the problem worldwide, it's not going to. You can't solve the problem in one country. That's the whole point of a pandemic: is that you can't close all the, unless you maybe you're with China and you just can be entirely draconian. But if you're not entirely draconian and most of the democracies won't be, then they, for them, this is just not a realistic plan to say that, you know, we're going to let the d disease fester and, and uh, you know, mutate uh, everywhere. And then it's going to keep coming back. If it mutates, it's going to come back a new one. And, you know, the UK is rightly frightened because they, they, they have AstraZeneca and AstraZeneca is not very protective against the Delta variant. So they're rightly scared. Uh, France, where I'm right now, should be really scared because France went with the strategy of over 50 people, over 55, I have all have AstraZeneca. Uh, this will be a, a massacre if, if, if the Delta variant comes back. So I, I don't understand what they're thinking. Even I, to be honest, I think this is this is this is. So this is not a question of democracy. If you 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 should be able to tell, go to the voters and say, look, this is just to protect ourselves. We're going to give them away because it's going to come and kill us. 
If that's what you need to say, you can say it. Why they're not saying it, I don't know. That's that's more baffling to me. Is you know, you know sometimes interest group politics, whatever U.S. Uh, tariffs on aluminum, that's too complicated. People can be fooled by it. You can imagine uh, you know uh, ways in which people like Trump can use it politically. But this one, it seems easy to see that it's just in everybody's interest to get it done because you know the UK is shut re-shutting down or not op reopening and my fear is France will re have to re-shut down after they open because this delta variant is here and it will I, I, I don't understand the logic of this this seems to me to be transparently uh, in the collective interest. So Ovijita, just to follow up from uh, the question that you just answered about the vaccine and it's a question on market failure in some ways. What I read, IMF came up with a budget that the cost of vaccinating everybody is $500 billion. 50. 50. 50 billion dollars. The world economy is what, $70 trillion? Yeah, yeah it's nothing. It's a drop. And, I mean, to... and the ROI would be like 300%, 400%. So why can't we find a way to structurally have the manufacturing capacity to vaccinate the world? You're talking, I'm, I, I'm kind of shocked when you said the AstraZeneca doesn't work, work against the Delta variant because all of India has been taking the AstraZeneca. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so, and, you know, and we know that that's why in India, the second wave was so brutal because a lot of older people who had been vaccinated got it. This is not, this is partly how people figured out that it doesn't work very well, is that a lot of vaccinated people got, got, uh, got uh, got uh, the, the Delta variant. So, uh, so why can't we do it? That's a... My question is not a general answer, but someone who you know goes into the micro. Give us like step, couple of steps. What do we need to do to, what would, should the world do to find manufacturing capacity to vaccinate the world? Well, I think manufacturing capacity to vaccinate the world, uh, I suspect that uh, the... <laughs> the two two questions. There. One is, should we uh, should we combine AstraZeneca with some other vaccine? Uh, and I think the answer is yes. I think the the to the there's a recent trial. I think the results came out yesterday, if I'm not wrong, showing that the uh, combining AstraZeneca with Pfizer, for example, actually is much more protective against the variants. And I think in general. The logic of, of the mutation suggests that different lines of attack joined together are going to be better. So that's, I say that because I think part of what needs to happen is Pfizer being produced in India. And I, I think it's not, I think Moderna has to me diminished itself by claiming that it's so difficult that the Indians couldn't do it and therefore they are just not sharing it with it. I think it's bullshit. I think we could do it. I, I think you, you're. I think the core, at the heart of what you're saying, is a very simple point, which is that we can do. India and South Africa and Brazil could manufacture tons and tons of these, and we could give it to the whole world. And I, I think that fifty billion dollars is a drop in the ocean. So it, it's it's really that these uh, the but the technology transfer needs to happen quickly, and we with some. Uh, grace. So, you know, Pfizer can't be pulled in kicking and screaming. They'll just make it so difficult that it won't happen. What we need is them to step forward and say, look, you know, this is, we're doing this for the gl global interest. We've already made a ton of money. And that would be, and you know, they'll be paid something out of the $50 billion. So I, I really do think that it's, I mean, the marginal cost of producing these vaccines is nothing to do with the price they're charging. Vaccines are very cheap to produce. It's just there's some fixed cost of developing the technology, and they're they're reaping that. And but now that, for example, this new one, uh, Covaxin, which also seems to be, you uh, know, Novovax, Novovax, which is also supposed to be very protective, uh, is also available. I think they should feel some competitive pressure. So maybe slowly uh, the gov. I mean, I, I, if I were the uh, I were the combine of the IMF, the World Bank, WTO, and WHO, I would try to start um, with whatever money we can raise, start bidding uh, on contracts to to actually help develop 
uh, vaccines somewhere. So pay somebody a fixed amount to now help India produce whatever, Novovax or Moderna or Pfizer, one of these which is going to be somewhat different from what we have and therefore together more productive, uh, protective. Just following up on that, do you think there is a case for a temporary waiver of patent rights to vaccine technology? And will I, that? I, I think there's a there is a case for buyouts at some price. And the US has, in a sense, said that it would, in principle, accept that. And since then, nothing's happened. What's really striking is after the Biden administration said that, they sat on their hands. I think what is really shameful is how uh, countries like the US have behaved in, in this one, I mean, in vis-a-vis in -vis, uh, COVID-19. They, they said that, you know, in principle, they'll be, but then, I don't know, maybe they're having behind the doors negotiations every day and they're just not ending, but it's, Every day you wait, you kill some people, and not just in in India. You kill some people in 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 the UK as well. I mean, this is this is a this is a pro situation where you know it's going to take three four months to develop uh, uh, you know capacity to produce uh, a new vaccine. I mean, it's not going to be faster than that. So we're talking about you know October or uh, November. So. It's, it's, you know, and so, and we're going to have perhaps one more wave before that. And so it, it really is, a, is a, it's catastrophic to keep waiting. And I don't understand what's happening. I, I, I think in principle, they have accepted that. The US government has accepted that, which is the key player in this. Uh, but in practice, they seem to be sitting on their hands. So, Vijita, before I go to the next question, I just ask you to send if you have any information about this AstraZeneca versus Pfizer for Delta variant, because there's been a lot of questions about it, uh, uh, saying that, um, you know, what is the difference between the two vaccines in terms of efficacy? Has there been any research? So it will be good for members to get that information. Um, the, the question Google Google it to be honest I what I would do is the what they can also do which is Google it it's it's completely in the public domain there's a British study and a French study and the French study shows that basically French study is a study of of uh, directly of uh, you know they they took out the uh, the people's uh, so the just of antibody production so not of full efficacy, but of antibody production. And they find that one dose of, of AstraZeneca gives you about a one third protection against the Delta variant, which is really not satisfactory. Right. So I'll switch the discussion. There's a comment that the discussion is on medicine, not economics. So I'll come back to the question on uh, economics. I know your focus is on inequality and poverty of people, but my question is more the inequality among companies. Um, you know, all of us, you know, from the limited liability corporation to bankruptcy code, the legal architecture allows, you know, companies, um, you know, a protection so that they can go and do, uh, you know, spend money and invest in things that they wouldn't have otherwise. It seems, however, for whatever reason, some companies have done incredibly well and most companies haven't done so well. You know, it seems that one day we'll be all shopping on Amazon and all our information would be on Google. And, you know, all our devices, maybe we'll be all, you know, energy, buying energy from Tesla. So where is this going in terms of com corporate or, you know, inequality uh, between some companies versus, you know, stock market is doing phenomenally when MSME companies aren't, you know, doing as well. So where is this going? And this is global, not just in one country. Oh, that's an excellent question. I, I mean, I, I think that I'm less, I'm going to say, I'm, uh, I'll bet against Tesla being supplying all our energy because I, I think there is a real difference. I think both Amazon uh, and Google have massive economies of scale. You know, you, once you have a set up a, a, a supply chain, your advantages are so massive because you, you know, you have like, you know, you have your, uh, you know, 
multiple steps in that you know you have storage if you have volume you can have storage in in the neighborhood if you don't have volume you can't have storage uh, except at some central location so i i do think that play amazon who uh, i think jeff bezos was you know brilliant in taking a bet that there the economies of scale would work there the economies of scale are really extraordinary in in retail uh, and I think that that's something that, um, and it would be Google, of course, is simply, you know, the be better the, better the, uh, you know, the, the original, uh, you know, search algorithm, more people use it, it gets enriched faster. It's just economies of scale are built into both of those. I don't think it's built into Tesla. I think Tesla uh, will have a technology, but it will be burnt into that technology. And the next company that comes in with a, a better way of producing batteries, for example, will will uh, just run through the market. I think it's it's a it's still the economies of scale are nowhere similar. So I, I think that, but the, having said that, we should be scared of these massive monopolies because they they do have the ability to block productivity growth. If you look at, so there's a nice study of in the US of what happens when uh, in different industry categories, um, a particular um, merger is approved or not. And when the merger is approved, over the next five years, you see less productivity growth, less employment growth, more profitability. Uh, it's, it's, it's very simple, you know, there's too much too many monopolies, too much mergers. It's a, there's nothing. There's no magic. We kind of know the economics of that, but it's happening in as we speak. So I I, I totally think that these are scarily uh, strong forces. But in practice, I think that it's going to be in certain industries and not others. I think the economies of scale are going to be particularly uh, dramatic in things like retail. The president will ask the last question and then I'll take the audience questions. Yeah, so I'll keep the question short. Uh, the question is a one-liner. Do you think political divisiveness is, hampers growth? Mm, I, I, I think that political, uh, political div divisiveness, um, all, in terms of the evidence, what we know is, you know, civil wars and semi-civil wars hamper growth. Uh, do we have as much evidence that political divisiveness at a more managed level? I think you've got muted there. Obijit, you've got muted. We've heard about your evidence with civil war. After that, you went mute. Okay, but yeah. not because of anything I did. It's 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 it had its own. It didn't like my views. Uh, but uh, but in general, I think that I I would not call growth. It seems to me that the wrong, that's the wrong question. Divisiveness makes us less. It makes us a less good society to live in. Makes people in the end growth is only worthwhile if it generates welfare. Divisiveness is bad for people and it makes people, you know, both I think because of the direct consequences and because of the indirect consequences. It allows political, political strategies of those who are not performing to, to succeed. I think in general, it's Trump uh, substituted uh, performance on anything. He just was essentially inept as a, a governor with div divisiveness as his political strategy. And that, that to me is the most worrying part is that, you know, when you have divisiveness as available to you, the pressure to do something useful goes down. And that to me is the real reason to worry about it. I think we'll uh, now leave the floor to uh, the audience. So Rudra is going to so the first question is, uh, I love the question from Dr. Nondini Rai. Uh, she said that when Amartya Sen became a Nobel laureate, they asked him to give a couple of things to the Nobel committee and he gave a Shanshito boy and his bicycle. What did you give? 
uh, what did I give? Um, I gave a set of, so to do an experiment, we did an experiment in Ghana where uh, we were trying to measure what happens if you take very poor people and you give them so, some comfort in their life, a little bit of extra money. And do they become lazy or do they become more productive? And we show in that experiment that they become more productive. How do we measure productivity? We actually created a, a, mini, a set of mini factories, about a few hundred, uh, each of which produced a lot of, were producing bags. Uh, uh, these bags were, um, you know, these women were given the material to produce bags. And one of the, what, what we were buying them from them, uh, the bags from them, and productivity was measured by how many they were producing and how fast. So that's, uh, so in that process, we of course acquired about 100,000, one lakh, more than a lakh bags. And I, I donated some bags to the museum. Okay, I'll ask a question that, it was a comment from Mr. Gautam Bhattacharjee. So I'll just turn it into a question, which is, you know, I, you know, there has been a lot of criticism of people who have won big awards, like Nobel laureates, that they are asked questions which are way outside their field. And they answer those questions way out of, outside their field. It's, I think it's got a name called brightness effect or something. Just because you're bright in one subject, can you be assumed to be brightness, bright in other subjects? What is your view? Does it happen? And what, what is your thought? Am I guilty of it? Surely. I mean, you know, people ask you all kinds of questions. Sometimes you're tempted to answer. Mostly I should resist the temptation. Uh, for example, I don't have a view on the brightness effect. Okay, okay, right. Okay, that's good. So uh, coming back to an economics question, I, I like these two um, lighter questions. I think uh, or very serious questions, but you know, non -league more in the nature of Bengal club, Nagraj, Bar kind of discussion. Uh, there's a, a question from Shantunu Ganguly. Uh, if that's the, uh, that's at least the iPad name that you're using. Huge forex reserves of $600 billion. What's the best way to use it? Well, uh, you know, I think if we actually have expansionary policies, we will, you know, the, we will lose the reserves. I think that's, I think we have, I think this, what is striking is how, how much imports have shrunk. You know, import growth has shrunk. And I think that's, that's a symptom of a demand shortage in the economy. And I think we, we shouldn't try to use the forex reserves. We should just try to get the economy to be lively. The economy is lively the uh, you know there will be need for foreign exchange people will be investing they're going to be uh, buying machines the foreign exchange will flow out that's that's the natural way to do it is to just have enough demand in the economy that uh, the uh, the foreign exchange gets used for the right purpose i wouldn't try to use it i would try to get the economy to be more dynamic is foreign forex reserve like an insurance that you know only need it at the critical juncture but otherwise it's useless no, it's, I mean, I think that it's a symptom of what's happening. So sometimes we are, we get foreign exchange reserves because, I mean, it's both are happening in India. Right now, the stock market is high because a lot of hot money is flowing in also. We are, we are, we are getting people, we are seen as being, maybe in a depressed world, we are seen as being less uh, bad uh, risk than others. So we are, we are, we are getting some foreign money. Mm, they are being invested, but it's what is doing is bidding up fixed assets, the assets that already exist. We're not creating new assets. There is some startups happening, but there are. If you take the fraction of the capital that we're talking about, it's still they are still small. So it's really not. It's a big part of it is just the world needs places to park its money. India's uh, the Indian stock market is seen as a better place than others, not necessarily great, but better. And money is coming in. And is bidding up the prices of the the basically the blue chips and the other you know relatively secure companies and that's that process is natural in a depressed world economy um, if the world economy becomes more lively and we lag behind it's going to stop they will, because the world economy likes to invest where the returns are high 
we, we shouldn't assume that it's our forgiven. In fact, the money left us. Remember, uh, yeah, yeah, there was a big outflow in the end of April, at the end, end of April, and then it came back in. Uh, so uh, I, I, my my sense is that we should uh, we should not worry about the foreign exchange as you know it's an outcome of many things. We should just t assume that we can finance a higher level of demand for now and expand demand. I think the economy there will be more investment. People will invest more if there's more demand. There'll be new companies coming up, and that's where we want. We want the capital foreign capital to come to new companies. And you know, small companies growing, and that's what's not happening. Okay. Chondrima Roy has a question about the recent and repetitive destruction of the Sundarbon, you know, with floods and um, it's a it's a yearly event. Do you think she asks MNCs worldwide are implementing adequate changes? to reduce environmental damage. So the question started by Shundarbon, but her question is more general about MNC. I, environment. You know, I don't know, I'm guessing no. I mean, why would they? I mean, if the regulators don't impose prices on them, why would they do it? They will pay lip service and do, you know, there'll be more greenwashing than uh, real green policies. And I, 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 I'm, I, I but I, I must confess, I'm, I haven't been checking on the MNCs what they've been doing, but why, you know, why would they? I don't see a reason why they would. I think there is a general problem and Sundarbans are a symptom of uh, the oceans are rising, climate change. I, I think it's not, we're not, this is a, the frequency of, of cyclones is going up in certain parts of the world. It's, I think these are all reasonably predictable by, by what's happening in the, in the environment. Also, but Ovichita, one thing is I was reading in the newspaper that in Shell, two activist investors because of climate policies have you know, forced themselves into the board and changing some of the policies. There's something to do with Exxon as well in the climate. So if it's, you know, if this has been carried by Financial Times, reported it, and about you know huge oil and gas companies, maybe there is something hope, hopeful, uh, and I don't know whether it's fast enough. Yeah, I agree with you. Both parts that it been, may, it is hopeful, and I don't know whether it's fast enough. Urmila Chakraborty asked a question: El Salvador has adopted cryptocurrency as legal tender. I think her question is: Is it like Mohammed bin Tughlaq? And it'll never happen again, you know. It'll or or is it something first of, you know, something that other countries will uh, also do? God knows. It's a it's a it's a bet that I think will depend very much on how the governments eventually play it. I think the I mean, the U.S. government, the Chinese government has decided it's it's going to not let the world cryptocurrencies dominate China. If I think uh, there's a reasonable case to be made that countries should have their own control of the monetary policy, in which case we we should start to see, uh, in my view, uh, more and more regulations placed on the cryptocurrencies. I I do have I don't see any particular reason why the uh, cryptocurrencies get the love they get. I, it seems to me that they're just doing damage, but but it, it's a I don't know it's a it's a very much I don't understand the political call that people have made to let them get to the point where there are trillions of dollars of that you know I I don't understand it I I was wrongly predicting that at some point the governments of the world will get exasperated and just shut them down and it's still possible. So thank you, Ovijida, for a great discussion. We have three minutes and would uh, call on Dr. Chatterjee for the vote of thanks. Good evening. It's, it's an unique occasion when one gets an opportunity to offer a vote of thanks to somebody I last talked to four decades ago in College Street, coming from an institution, neighboring the institution that our guest today went to. It is, of course, unique that the Bengal Club has a chance to give a vote of thanks to one of 10 Indians who has won the Nobel Prize, one of six couples in the history of civilization to have won that coveted prize as well. And I think hearing Obhijit's discussion today and, and the wide range of topics he covered in this very short time, from the judiciary to economics to environment to Google, 
And I must say, I felt quite at home because he spent a lot of time discussing medicine. And I've just a few seconds before this meeting read the Lancet article on the vaccines published this afternoon. But thank you very much for really an enthralling evening for the members of the Bengal Club. He did treat us to a wide range of facts, a lot of fearsome facts and prophecies. And perhaps I should end with the words of Alfred Nobel, whose prize he has won for us. Uh, Alfred Nobel said, hope is nature's veil for hiding truth's nakedness. And I think uh, Obijit epitomizes that we still all live in hope while we listen to the truth's nakedness that is uh, expanded before us. Thank you very much. And I have to also take this opportunity to thank Rudra and Gopal who have made this evening possible. Thank you very much uh, on behalf of all members of the Bengal Club. And thank you for having me. Uh, it was a great pleasure. And uh, keep coming back to Calcutta once travel opens up. <laughs> yes, I, it's not because of my not wanting to come back that this is not happening. Okay, bye. Best. Thank you very much, Shima. Thank I you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.